So let's begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mbogiseni Butelezi from the Public Affairs Research Institute. Uh, we're very pleased that you have joined us this afternoon um, and we're hoping we're going to have a very robust discussion about the Ngonyama Trust in particular, but about uh, institutions more broadly um, of the nature of the Ngonyama Trust in South Africa at this time, in, uh, at this point in our history. Let me start by thanking um, the partners uh, who uh, um, uh, have partnered with us on this event. I'm from the Public Affairs Research Institute, but um, the lead partner um, on this event is the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Um, and we have also had uh, financial support uh, from the Hans Seidel Foundation. I'd also like to thank uh, LARC, the Land and Accountability Research Center, uh, from, who, from which uh, two of the panelists uh, come. Uh, for partnering uh, on this event. So let me kick off by saying um, there's some of the questions we want to tackle uh, in this discussion it, it, uh, are the following. What are the Ingonyama Trust legal and financial obligations towards its beneficiaries? Where does the Ingonyama Trust Board fit in? What impact has the operations and the administration of the trust had on the land rights and the livelihoods of its beneficiaries? Fourth, uh, has the Ingonyama Trust Board succeeded or failed to ensure that land vested in the trust is administered for the material welfare of its beneficiaries as uh, its founding act uh, says it should do? How has the board attempted to circumvent accountability for compliance with its constitutional and legislative obligations? And finally, what is the experience of people living on the land administered by the trust, where the trust had or att has had attempted to conclude um, income generating contracts without the consent of its rights holders or of rights holders? Why are we asking these questions uh, now? In 2019, just over a year ago, we hosted um, the first in, of these discussions where we were asking the question of uh, how did the Ngonyama Trust come about? Um, we, we heard from uh, Hillary, Hillary Lind, a historian from the United States, who's had unprecedented access, in fact, to people who were involved in the negotiations for the establishment of the trust on the side of the apartheid government about how the trust actually came about. We're then following up with this discussion um, where we're thinking about what, what accountability are we going to see going forward? And we're asking this in light of some events uh, that have happened recently, to which I'll, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get in a moment. But before I get to that, let's just think back to um, just a high level overview of the establishment of the trust and how it comes to be that we have the Singoyama Trust. The trust was established in 1994 uh, to manage land that uh, had fallen under, well, at the time it fell under the Guazulu uh, homeland. Um, it was established by the Guazulu Natal Ingonyama Trust Act in 1994. And it was really a deal between the National Party and the Ingata Freedom Party at the time. What the trust does it is, is administer 2.8 million hectares of land, um, subject to very important provisions in the act that, I mean, that um, Zenande is going to talk about in a little while. The act was amended in 1997 to establish the Ingonyama Trust Board um, that, that actually does the administering of the land. Again, that, uh, this is a matter that um, Zenande and Janet will touch on later. Why is the trust important, so important now? And why are we having this discussion? I think there, there are at least three things just as a way of framing that we need to be um, alert to in thinking about the role of the trust. The first one has to do with rights, with people's rights. The, the Establishing Act, um, as will be touched on later, is very clear on the requirement of the trust to protect the, protect the rights of people living on the land that it administers. These are customary and informal land rights. Um, and the issue that we're, we've faced, we've seen happen over a period of time, is that these rights are being slowly converted into lease agreements. Uh, which is what uh, I mean, one of the major uh, areas we're going to focus on today. The second thing um, that uh, is of interest at this point is this question of, in a constitutional democracy like ours, institutions 
need to serve the needs and the interests of the majority of the people. Institutions, I, 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 I would say, are not immutable. They change over time, they are adapted, adapted as the need arises to meet uh, the, 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 the requirements of the people whom they are supposed to serve. At this time in South Africa, we are in a, in a phase of institution rebuilding. Think here of the NPA and the Hawks and the work we've done, we've seen done uh, on those institutions. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the right time to ask uh, questions of institutions, ask the difficult questions. Um, that, and that, that, that also includes asking questions of the Ngonyama Trust. So some of the questions I think we need to ask are, does the Ngonyama Trust serve the needs and the interests of the people whose land it administers? And I deliberately, deliberately say whose land it administers um, for, for a reason I'll touch on later. And we also, I think, need to ask ourselves the question, is a trust, is the trust of this nature the best vehicle for that purpose of administering the, the land um, for the people on behalf of the people who live on it, on behalf of the owners of that land, one might say. And also, can this trust work better than what we've seen so far, as we're gonna hear about uh, in a little while. The third area, in, in, in our framing, I think, is the question of accountability. Here, I also want to point out that the trust has a very poor track record of refusing to account uh, to parliament in particular, of uh, obfuscating uh, its annual financial statements, um, of being very defensive and even arrogant uh, when it's call called to account to parliament. And at the heart of that problem, I think, is a question of sovereignty that I'll return to in a moment. But we may actually have turned a corner. Let me decide two examples um, of things that have happened in recent times when it comes to the accountability of the trust. In April this year, we heard that uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Land Reform and Rural Development was withholding funding uh, for the current financial year for the non-submission of um, the annual budget of the trust. The portfolio committee um, actually recommended suspending the funding uh, of the trust for failing to account. This is, I think, um, a, a major development. The second thing we've also heard is that um, the portfolio committee, um, uh, chaired by Inkosi Zueli Velile Mandela, has welcomed a probe into governance breaches and the violations of the Public Finance Management Act uh, by the trust. This happened in, in October with a statement released by Parliament on the 22nd of October. Again, I think this is the, the beginning of uh, turning a corner when it comes to accountability. But I wanna end with um, a thought about the reason why we face these kinds of challenges, the reason why we have to ask these kinds of questions, uh, in my view, about institutions at this point. And that is a question of sovereignty, I think. We, we face a, a problem, I think, in South Africa when it comes to traditional authorities more generally, where because of the, the, the introduction by colonial and apartheid governments of a state as, an, as a, a, a political entity that got overlain over the um, pre-existing political arrangements in African societies. In the post-apartheid period, we're finding where our traditional authorities seem to want to think that they have sovereignty, sovereignty vests in them. Uh, and, and I think, um, unfortunately, what we have is actually a state and a constitutional democracy. That, um, uh, and then I think that's where the sovereignty vests, that's where ultimate authority uh, in this country lies. So the refusal to account is, is uh, I, it seems to me, an ability, I mean, an attempt to say that um, because these institutions predate colonialism, predate apartheid, they should not be accountable to a state that has come out of a period, a period of 200 years of colonialism and apartheid. And I, I think that that is a, a mistake. Um, we have tried in the past uh, to bring into these conversations, into asking these kinds of questions, people associated with the trust itself. I think that would actually be the best way to hold these conversations. But unfortunately, in line with this trend of refusing to account, refusing to be, to be asked questions publicly, um, we've never been able to have people associated with the trust in these conversations. I'm hoping that in future, we'll be able to have those kinds of conversations.
So with that, may I then turn over to our panelists who are going to help us untangle uh, these questions. But uh, in fact, before I do that, um, let, let me just say, in terms of um, uh, our, our discussion, what we're going to ask is that um, you put your, your questions in the uh, Q&A box rather than in the chat. The Q&A box um, it works much better. Um, we've received some questions prior to the event via email, so we will feed them the, those questions into the conversation as we go along. Some of those are questions that cannot really be answered by this panel. They would be better be answered by people uh, um, who are associated with the trust, but unfortunately, as I've said, uh, we don't have any such people uh, as part of this conversation. So our three panelists, um, let, me, let me introduce the first one. I'll introduce them each uh, just before they speak. Um, the first one to speak is going to be uh, Zenande Boy, who heads activities within the Land and Accountability Research Center uh, uh, in their land uh, research stream. Pa prior to joining LARC, uh, she was the Crowley Fellow in International Human Rights at the Gladner Center for International Law and Justice at the Fordham School of uh, Law in New York City. Uh, she graduated with an LLB from the University of Cape Town and completed a master's in international legal studies and international human rights law at Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, DC. With that, may I turn over to Zenanda then, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much, Mungzeni. Um, I want to start off by thanking the Nelson Mandela Foundation for again holding the space to have this important discussion that has tangible implications for the lives and livelihoods of people that are meant to be beneficiaries of the Nganyama Trust. Most of them are some of the poorest and most marginalized members of our society. Um, to start us off, I will be giving some context to help guide the discussion that we're gonna be having today, which will ultimately consider the powers of, and functions of the trust, the finances and financial accountability obligations of the trust, and whether the, trust and whether the beneficiaries of the trust actually benefit from the operations as is required by the legal framework, as Mwongi Seni was saying. The bottom, on, the bottom line is that the operations of the trust, which I'll touch on, generate significant income for the trust. This income is largely made through the exploitation and development of land that is vested in the trust that it is holding on behalf of its beneficiaries. And to what end is the question, do these people even see a fraction of the benefit derived from the exploitation of their land? Moreover, issues faced by poor rural um, residents, including those on land administered by the trust, were significantly exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19 and the regulations adopted to curb its spread. People were and continue to be desperate for assistance from institutions tasked with um, improving their circumstances. Where has the trust been when people at their most vulnerable needed assistance? An important point of departure that we, that we need to move from, as Umbongi Seni mentioned, is to sort of talk about the legal um, framework that regulates the, um, regulates the trust. The trust is the creature of legislation. Its powers, the limits of those powers, and the obligations are determined by that legislation, applicable laws, and related regulations. The Ngonyama Trust Act lays these powers and limitations out with some clarity. Important provisions that I want to highlight from the Ngonyama Trust Act provide that the trust, that the land is vested in the trust and it is held on, be on behalf of traditional communities and other communities and residents living on the land. These are the beneficiaries of the trust. The land is to be administered for the benefit, material welfare and social well-being of these beneficiaries, subject to their land rights and other existing rights. As Umbungi Seni mentioned, the Ngonyama Trust Board was created in 1997 and it is, was carried out to carry out the functions of the trustee. Its function is to administer the affairs of the trust and the trust land in accordance with the Trust Act, the Constitution and Zulu customary law. It is essentially the functioning arm of the trust and exercises the powers that are vested in the trust and the trustee subject to the same limitations and obligations that would fall onto the trust. Importantly, the act gives the board no corporate capacity or juristic personality or legal status that is separate from the trust. So what are the powers and obligations of the trust and trustee? The trustee through the Ngonyama Trust must administer the land in terms of Zulu customary law, as well as the act itself. And when something is done on the land that impacts the rights of the land that exists on the land already, examples including the leasing of the land or disposing the land in any way, 
then before the trust can do anything, it must get the consent of a traditional council or a community authority as is defined in the act. But what is more important is that it must comply with relevant laws. And in this case, those laws would include the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act. EPILMA requires that the consent of informal land rights holders be obtained before being deprived of their land rights. Depriving people of their rights to land includes either significantly changing or limiting that right or the person's ability to exercise that right. Section 27 of the Act as well confirms that EPILMA is applicable and it provides that any national land program shall be applicable on, state, on land that is held by the trust. An incredibly important provision that underscores key limitations to the powers of the trust in its administration of the land is that no existing rights or interests shall be infringed by the trust. This ties in with the trust's obligations to comply with the PILRA when it is dealing with the land. What is important and made clear from the provisions of the Trust Act that I've highlighted is that people that live on land administered by the trust are not just holders of rights to land that must be respected and protected. They are also meant to be material beneficiaries of the administration of that land by the trust. So having set out the general legislative framework that governs the operation of the trust, I'll be touching on some of the main operations that the trust has been carrying out on land that's vested in it, that it holds on behalf of its beneficiaries. And these operations are the main ways in which the trust generates income and makes revenue for its, that, that then goes into the trust. But a number of general questions are particularly important for our purposes today and going forward in having this discussion. One, has the operation of the trust through the board, how has the operation of the trust through the board affected the land rights of its beneficiaries? Ha um, sorry, the second question is, have the trust's beneficiaries substantively benefited from how the land is being administered? Has their material welfare, social well-being been substantively approved, improved directly from the administration of their land by the trust? And three, and this is a question that my colleague Janet will be going into more detail about, but what are the financial and accounting obligations of the trust and has it been in compliance with those obligations? So in an effort to, um, to fill in a gap related to the security of tenure of customary land rights, unregistered rights and other legally underprotected rights, the trust held, I mean, held by residents on trust land, the trust has been concluding long-term um, residential leases. Also, to ex also ostensibly to expedite development on trust land, um, the trust has been concluding long-term commercial leases with the trust itself as the lessor. So the long-term residential leases are concluded mostly with people that hold pre-existing land rights, either in terms of customary law or in terms of historic tenure. And those are the people that usually fall into the category of beneficiaries of the Trust Act. People that live on land administered by the trust usually hold their land rights in one of two ways. They're either customary law ownership holders, um, and these ownership rights in terms of customary law are recognized and protected by the constitution, a PILRA, and no rental um, is required to be paid when you hold customary land rights. The other way that people generally hold rights to land is through permission to occupy permits. These are apartheid era permits that were given to black people living on unsurveyed rural land. They were granted in perpetuity. The rights granted were inheritable and no rent was required for people that held these PTOs. Importantly, in terms of the upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act, PTOs can also be converted into title deeds. So PTOs have an, uh, an incredible racist history and are by no means the form in which we should be dealing with tenure in a democratic South Africa. However, we are still waiting for the state to adopt comprehensive legislation and a legislative framework that recognizes, protects land rights of black people that have been weakened and denied through racist laws. However, these residential leases that are being, that are being concluded by the trust are not the answer because they weaken rights held by people to their land by, by turning people into, into tenants on their own ancestral land. Residents are being deprived of their ownership rights to land with no indication that this is being done with their free and informed consent as is required by PILRA and the constitution. Also depriving residents of stronger ownership rights and replacing them with weaker tenancy rights violates section 25.6 of the constitution. Residential leases also undercut the long-term 
land and tenure reform objectives of the constitution and any other sort of response that the state wants to make in, in terms of securing the rights held by people that have been previously unprotected. The residential leases are also a significant revenue for the trust and it supports to parliament and in its reports to parliament, um, the trust has been unable to show how this money that it is making from people actually benefits the residents or communities that hold leases with them and pay rent to them. The trust has also been concluding long-term commercial leases, largely with third-party companies, individuals, and individuals that are not necessarily for part of the communities that this land is, is located. Sometimes some of these commercial leases are also concluded with community members from those areas. These, um, the trust describes this process as being aimed at facilitating and coordinating rural development in KZN. And as a result, when you drive through the rural communities across KZN, you see the landscape changing right before your eyes. Developments such as shopping malls, residential and office developments, mining operations, resorts and lodges completed or um, at different stages of construction can be seen everywhere. A significant amount of money is generated from these leases. Um, the trust's website states that the money is used for traditional council support through training traditional councils and providing bursaries for youth in rural areas. There is little indication that this actually, uh, that this actually happens. Just like the residential leases that I've just spoken about, um, these leases have the effect of depriving communities of their constitutionally protected rights to land. Long-term leases to mine or to build a shopping center or a resort significantly change the rights that exist of the, over that land and community members are no longer able to exercise those rights to land or able to access the land or its natural resources that have been part of those communities for generations. There is little indication that these commercial leases are concluded in, con in accordance with the provision of the Trust Act, Zulu Customary Law or EPILRA. Community partners that we've worked with report not being informed of intended developments, not knowing the terms of the leases or the impact that the development will have on their land rights and their, access, and their ability to access the natural resources on this land. In Somgela, for example, people have been moved from their homes to make way for mining. And when negotiations were underway for compensation for the, the loss of their livelihoods and for having to move to make way for this mine, the mine in question refused to compensate people for the loss of rights to land because they told people that they, um, that they had a lease, a surface lease with the Ingonyama Trust and that they were paying the Ingonyama Trust land, um, le uh, excuse me, rent for the land that they will be using for mining operations. Therefore, people weren't entitled to be compensated for losing the rights to ancestral homes, to their plowing fields and to other um, parts of the community that they would otherwise have used for other natural resources. These families knew nothing about these leases, how these leases, how this lease um, would impact them. They had no idea that um, this money was supposed to be benefiting them. And the communities continue are still in struggle trying to get proper compensation from the mine. And the trust is nowhere to be seen to provide com the communities um, the support they need to hold the mine accountable or to benefit from this lease that they have concluded with this mining company. Um, in Makasaneni, um, at, which is sort of documented in the, in the documentary, This Land, um, people woke up to find a foreign mining company intending to um, begin prospecting work on their land. This is land that they have lived on and worked on for generations. They had never been informed of intentions for such development um, efforts on their land, on, on their fields. Their consent had not been obtained before any decisions had been made. In that case as well, the Ngonyama Trust had concluded a surface lease with the mining company to allow for prospecting. Rent was being paid for the company to work on the land, but the people who live on it and work on it had no idea about anything related to the operations and the lease concluded over their land. This lack of visibility of the trust in providing substantive and material benefit to communities that host these developments that it makes money from is par of course under normal circumstances. However, their absence was felt even more sharply um, in the communities that we work with who bore the brunt of the impact of COVID-19 and the regulations that were adopted to curb its spread. Community members gave accounts of not being able to access food parcels, services like water and sanitation and other relief efforts 
um, in response to, to COVID-19. There has been no indication that the trust has been anywhere to be seen in this time of immense crisis in the communities that are forced to host developments that generate a lot of income from it. Um, so I'm going to hand over back to Umbo Ngiseni and my colleague um, Janet will go into more detail about the financial obligations of the trust and issues that have arisen in attempts to hold it accountable for the money that it makes on the land it administers. Thank you, Zanande, uh, for that um, uh, overview. I think um, it leads quite nicely into what Janet is going to talk about. Uh, so just to introduce Janet briefly, uh, she holds a BA LLB from the University of the Vet Vadras and is an attorney. Um, she is an experienced property lawyer and was director of a uh, Cape Town law firm where she combined a diverse commercial and property law practice with an interest in water law and restitution of land rights. She's currently involved in research in this field and is in the interpretation of fiduciary duties of state land trusts in post-colonial jurisdictions. She's also a research associate of LARC. Janet, thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mbuseni. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Um, as Zananda, my colleague, has mentioned, I'm going to be a de um, a detailing um, aspects of the issue of accountability in relation to the Nguyenyama Trust and its board, um, and um, probably dealing with very uh, more specific details rather than practical um, examples. But um, I think just to frame what I'm going to say, I think it's important as both Mugoseni and um, uh, Zananda have mentioned, that um, it's important to view the question of accountability in the context of beneficiaries of the Inunama Trust. These are the members, the tribes, um, and the residents listed in the Act. The beneficiaries are the primary um, stakeholders of the trust, and in terms of the in terms of the act, in terms of the act, the trust must be administered for their benefit, material welfare, and social well-being. As um, Zananda mentioned, the leasing practices on trust land indicates that the, the trust under the leasing approach has accumulated significant reserves, yet with what seems to be a, a significantly low ratio of distribution of these reserves to beneficiaries. Um, it's important to understand then how the Inganyama Trust Board, who is the financial uh, reporting authority for the trust, reports income and how they report distribution to beneficiaries. Um, this brings us uh, directly to the question of accountability. Now, the Inganyama Trust Act does require a higher level of accountability. The Inganyama Trust Act has attached to it um, a set of administrative and uh, financial regulations, and the financial regulations specifically apply to all income earned or accrued to the trust, and which is subject to the provisions of the Public uh, Finance Management Act, the PFMA, as I will call it, uh, going through this um, short presentation. Now, the PFMA is an important act. It sets the rules for how state entities report on public funds um, that they use. Its purpose is to secure transparency, its accountability, sound management of revenue. And, and important to this forum, I think, is the, in, is the issue of accountability um, in that we have noticed in our research that the Inganyama Trust Board has developed a position that save for one treasury regulation, which we can talk about in our chat afterwards, which is regulation uh, 14, the Inganyama Trust is not subject to the provisions of the Public Finance Management Act. Um, how can that be, uh, one would ask, but um, it seems that the board appears over the years uh, as the accounting authority for the trust to have regularly um, complied with the provisions of the PFMA until 2015, 2016. However, in 2015, 2016, the Auditor General queried the way in which information was presented and the Auditor General expressed concern that the accounts for the trust and that of the board had become conflated and this made it difficult to identify which income and expenditure was for the trust and which income and expenditure was for the board. Um, the Auditor General issued an adverse opinion um, that year and asked the board to provide separate financial statements for the two entities, one for the trust, one for the board. Um, now this led on to an interesting sort of series of events um, 
And it seems that and from our reading of, of what happened, um, looking at the annual financial statements, um, parliamentary uh, committee meeting minutes, it seems that the board has interpreted this to mean that the Inganyama Trust and the Inganyama Board are two separate legal entities. Um, this interpretation actually has profound influence on budgetary requirements, as well as the status of the trust and the trust obligations under the PFMA. The board goes on then to argue that therefore the provisions of the PFMA do not apply to the trust. Um, the board's interpretation seems to be based on the fact that the PFMA includes a schedule of state funded entities that are bound by its provisions. This is a schedule attached to the PFMA. This schedule includes the Inganyama Trust Board. However, while it is true that the name of the board is listed on the PFMA schedule, this is because it is the board that is the accounting authority of the trust. And it is the duty of the board to prepare and present PFMA compliant reports for the trust in terms of the financial regulations. So I think what we're saying here is that they are, they are dealt with, the, the board and the trust are separate, but they're not a separate entity. In fact, this matter came to a head in 2017 and the then Minister of Rural Development and Land Affairs obtained a legal opinion which clarified that the Inganyama Trust Act created one entity and that is the trust with an administrative body which is the board. Um, uh, Zananda has already explained um, this, this uh, structure. In other words, the board and the trust are effectively one entity in which the board exists only to perform administrative duties of the trust. In effect, it would not exist if it were not created um, in service of the trust. Nonetheless, the board has pressed on with its interpretation. Um, in fact, in the last, in the last, um, in the Auditor General's opinion in 2018 and 2019, this gives the clearest indication yet that the board is entrenching this notion. It, it states that with reference to the Inganyama Trust, we submit that save for Treasury Regulation 14, the provisions of the PFMA do not apply to the trust. Their submission is based on or premised on the following arguments that the trust is not a public entity under the PFMA, that it does not receive any funding from the state, that it is neither a constitutional institute or a government department, and it is only associated with the state by virtue of being created by a statute. I want to briefly, because I think this is really important, uh, just respond. Um, to these arguments by pointing out a, a couple of things. The first is that the trust is a national public entity. It's publicly funded through money that the state bears. Um, the, the state actually bears for the, uh, the cost of the administration of the board. That is in terms of the Inganama Trust Act. Um, the trust, Inganama Trust is established by national legislation. It's accountable to parliament. Um, an important uh, note is that the trust benefits significantly from an exemption uh, for paying income tax in terms of section 10 of the Income Tax Act. Um, there are first further losses that result to the fiscus as a result of this. Um, Zanande mentioned uh, lease income. Commercial lease, for instance, is not taxed in the hands of the trust and it, rental would be allowed as a deduction by the lessees. It's also important that the Constitutional Court has held that the trust is an organ of state, stating that there can be little doubt that the trust exercises public power and performs functions in terms of legislation. Um, if one looks at the Constitution, an organ, of, an organ of state is any department of state or administration in the national, provincial or local sphere of government. Um, it's important also that the Constitution pl places basic values and principles governing public administration of organs of state. Um, as Zanande mentioned that it is clear that the trust is linked to the state. The Trust Act specifies that the minister is the executive authority of the trust. It specifies that the trust must report to the minister and to the parliament on its work every year. And it specifies that the trust land will be subject to any state land reform program. Um, the Supreme Court of Appeal has also ruled that it's, it's uh, it, it cannot be that the trust is not part of the st state if, it can, if it's part of a state land reform program. 
Moreover, in terms of the Act, um, the uh, Inganyama Trust is exempt from the provisions of the Trust Property Control Act, and it seems inconceivable that an entity which has been entrusted with 2.8 million hectares of land is not subject to any oversight at all. Now, why does this matter? Um, as Nandi has mentioned, the Inganyama Trust holds assets worth hundreds of millions of rands on behalf of people on the trust land for their benefit, material welfare, and social well-being. Therefore, the, the trust should be disclosing exactly how much re revenue there is in terms of, for example, leases, commercial ventures, tourism ventures, forests, and quarries. It should be public knowledge what this money, which is being held in trust for the people, is being expended for the benefit of its stakeholders. If there's inadequate reporting of revenues and expenditure, it's impossible to know where the money is going. Um, as Mbogisendi also mentioned, to their credit, MPs have played an important role in asking questions of the Board and the Trusts and Parliament's Portfolio Committee on Rural Development and Land Reform over the years has repeatedly tried to clarify whether the Trust mandate to provide benefit to communities is being held, upheld with little success. As far back as October 2016, the committee asked the Minister to ensure that the Board comply with reporting on all funds, irrespective of where they were sourced. It asked the Minister to help the Board to draw up a report on the impact of its beneficiary programmes going back five years. In October 2019, the Board was asked for clarity on the 10% fee that went to the Board and the 90% that went back to the community. This is a reference to the Inganyama Trust Financial Regulation 10.2, which allows an amount of 10% of the trust income to be utilized for administrative purposes. Again, a five-year report was requested. In May and June this year, this was repeated by, this request was repeated by the chair of the portfolio committee meeting. These reports have not been provided. Parliament, as has been mentioned, has now withheld funding for the board for the 2021 financial year while it waits for the board to deliver the information it has asked for. I understand that the minister has appointed an interim board and also has instituted a forensic audit. Um, but where are we going forward? Um, perhaps for the sake of clarity and so as to avoid confusion which seems to have risen. The schedule to the PFMA should be amended and the name of the trust added to it. The PFMA provides on unlisted entities that the accounting authority, in this instance the trust board, of any national entity that is incorrectly or not listed under the PFMA is under a legal obligation to inform the minister that the entity should be added. This is something that the board should do. The Minister of Finance also has the ability to do this by making a provision in the Government Gazette. In conclusion and in short, what we have found in reading the annual financial statements is that distributions to beneficiaries are vaguely reported. They're given very little relevance with little or no mention of how distributions are put to use. Arguing that the trust is not accountable under the PFMA is concerning and it's a red flag. It permits a lack of oversight and transparency over the nature of trust funds and the allocation to projects that will benefit the principal stakeholders, these being the beneficiaries of the trust. I think I'm handing over uh, back to you, Mugaseni, but um, uh, I'll do that. Thank you, Janet. Um, there are some interesting questions already uh, popping up in the chat, but one I want to just feed in now um, has just been posed by Mashile Palani. It asks, I mean, Mashile is asking, does the, where does the Ngunyama Trust land stay, stretch from? Uh, and does that include urban towns like Durban? So um, those 2.8 million uh, hectares that we're talking about, uh, which part of the province do they cover? Okay, um, the Ngunyama Trust land it, it is, um, because it, it flows through from the former um, homelands, is, is non-contiguous. So it's patches all over the province of KZN. Um, it specifically excludes urban towns. So that's 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 specifically excluded in terms of the of the what was in, excluded in terms of the amendment act. So it's pockets of land really all over the province of, of KZN. 
Thanks, Janet. So I think at this point, I'll bring in um, our third panelist, and then we'll circle back to the questions. Uh, the third panelist, the, uh, our, our, our invitation had said, uh, Reverend Mavu, Mbekseni Mavuso uh, was going to be the third panelist. Unfortunately, in Makasaneni, uh, uh, where he is, outside uh, Melmoth, it wasn't at all, uh, he's having very, very bad connectivity. So uh, thankfully, uh, we have Le Raton Dombela, uh, who's a, also an activist uh, from Wazul Natal. And in line with what Janet has just said about um, where the land is, uh, she's from Ezingolweni, which is way down south in Wazul Natal. So, Jen, uh, um, so Lerato, uh, if you could uh, tell us about your experience with the Ngonyama Trust. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hello, Lerato, um, you are live. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, afternoon, all. Um, here at the uh, table, and in fact, the best, this problem for the child is affecting the community of KZN. Uh, in, in my community, like in my community, there are people who pay in the normal child, and also the normal child didn't do anything for us. Like in the schools, uh, churches, uh, donating to the people who are poor or who are in need. L and right also, wait, 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 sorry, we're just struggling with your sound. Um, do you want to just move around a little bit? Maybe we'll get a better, better sound, a better sound from you. Hello. Hello. Well, there's an echo in the background. Um, I'm not sure what that is from. Okay, carry carry on. Thanks. Okay. So what what I, I, I see here, the traditional leaders, they trust the you know never trust here in in KZN. If uh, as we are the, the community, when we try to to talk about this thing, uh, paying money, the lease. They, they, they want us to take me. They go door to door so that we can take the fee. Others, they take it, especially those ones from government to work from government. Uh, those ones who, when they want a subsidy, they, they go to Ingonema Trust and then they pay every year this money. And also, if you want the business here, yeah. if you want the business, you, you pay. To Ingonema Trust. For example, there's a lady who got go a, a land a, from, from our, our chief. So, who could pay, pay, whether she didn't, she didn't do anything, she didn't give, in fact, she wanted that land to build a garage, a cultural garage. But she didn't give for, for now it's for five years now. But he paid, she paid uh, that money to the Indonesian Trust. Take a matter of she paid every year. I think she paid about 35,000, 38,000 to Indonesian Trust. But there's nothing there, nothing to do with that uh, business. I am concerned about this issue because I didn't hear anything from our government. What the state uh, he take about this about this uh, issue? Yes, we hear Chairman uh, Diza, we hear Mandela, but the others, especially the traditional leaders, are not very happy of uh, of the people of their people who are supported by by the Indian trust. Our businesses here, we pay for, 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 the, for, our, for our businesses. We pay for our loans. I don't know, uh, government, what actually government pays it about those things of paying, uh, of paying for our loans. And also, if I am government, I can say, uh, the Indian Trust may pay 
the church is now a leader and the headman. Uh, because there are a lot of money that they get, they get but they didn't do anything in our community. Why don't they pay uh, the, the traditional leader and they are happy? The government must be pay these people. Government must take this money and, and do the development in our community. Because we need clinics, we need hospitals, we still need schools and quality. We don't have all those things. But there are a lot of money goes to the traditional leader. Whereas they don't do anything in our community. Even the traditional leader, the chief, the traditional leader, the chief, they don't do anything. They don't contribute. They know they are people who are suffering, but they don't contribute to anything. They just collect the money to the poor people. I don't know uh, government can take that and or and can look for this thing that is happening uh, in our community, especially in, uh, in our area. We are suffering. We pay. We don't work. We don't work. We don't have money to pay, but they force us to pay. They force us to pay. Anything, anything. If you put a tax shop in, in, a, in your house, they say you must pay for that. Thank you. Thank you, Lerato. So the issue I'm hearing here is that, um, I mean, so to, to, to speak, we've just heard from the horse's mouth, so to speak. People are being asked to pay uh, on their own as ancestral land. And as Lerato was saying, they're not seeing the benefit um, of this money that they're being asked to pay. Uh, I mean, the figure of 35 to 38,000 rand being paid for uh, what is a commercial lease um, and everybody who has a little tuck shop having to pay when they are trying to eke out a living. Um, the writer is calling for a government intervention. Government needs to intervene uh, to stop these things. We also have um, a lot of other questions that have come in, uh, fantastic questions. Uh, some of them are in the Q&A. And if I could just remind everybody, instead of using the chat, uh, please use the Q&A box. The Q&A box um, works much better. But I'm going to start and I'm gonna take uh, the questions in clusters of three. Some of them are actually not questions, they're, they're just comments. Um, we've received some questions from uh, people who've sent them in via email. I'll, I'll start with the three that we've received. The first um, is, and somebody's asked a similar question in the Q&A, what are the implications of the trust for other uh, ethnic groups in different provinces? Um, the, the the person is saying, I think they would um, also like to get assistance uh, in the way that the trust is getting from government. There's a similar question in the trust, I mean, in the Q&A, asking um, wh wh what does this mean, in fact, for the country more broadly, to have a trust like this in Wazul Natal. Uh, I'll, I'll also uh, I'll throw in another question uh, related which has just come in and says, does the Etegudi municipality have any say in the Gonyama Trust land um, in terms of you, uh, land use management powers and how these powers are exercised? So let's think about, uh, let's just uh, ask that question. I'm gonna direct it um, to you, uh, Zenande, to, to kick us off. The second is actually two questions. Um, it's about uh, the farms uh, in particular that are vested in the Ngonyama Trust. The person is asking, um, this is Nonom Sani, um, why uh, does, doesn't the, the trust lease these farms? They are just unoccupied and are being uh, vandalized. The second question is, um, why doesn't the, 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 the trust follow up where is Induna? I illegally subdivide farms into portions and sell them um, to, the, to communities for between 50 and 100,000 rand. Uh, per plot of land, uh, even when community members have reported uh, the, these matters. And the third one comes from somebody who would like to remain anonymous. 
Uh, I wish to know, uh, according to the act that guides the nomination of people to uh, become members of the, of, the, of the board, and this is for you, Janet, uh, how long can a person be serve on the board? And the reason for this question is that um, since the inception of the ITB, it seems like the same people are still on the board. Uh, one would think that they actually own the trust. So let's start with those. I'm going to ask you, Zananda, to kick us off. Thank you. So on the first question around um, the implications for this trust for sort of other um, traditional communities um, and other provinces. So, I mean, this is also something that the Portfolio Committee um, chairperson, who Mr. Mandela was speaking about, was saying, well, if the trust seems, so we need to sort of be looking at this trust. If this trust is a good way of, of dealing with land, then this trust should be something that's replicated across the country. Um, so, I mean, there are sort of many issues with that in that the trust itself, I mean, even from the conversation that we'd had before around why the trust was created, it wasn't really created on the, for, for the purposes of actually protecting people's land rights. Um, it was, it was the, from, from what we've heard, what we heard from the research that Lynn did um, is that it was really just a political, um, it was political um, concessions made to make sure that our transition period moves forward. Um, but the problem with, with that is with, with sort of trying to replicate this model is that really trusts aren't a very good way of protecting people's rights. And that's what we need to be doing in terms of section 25, six of the constitution, people that have insecure tenure rights need to have those rights made secure and they need to have those rights protected. Now, the problem with how a trust works and trusts being beneficiaries is that there is no clarity really about how people's rights exist. You're seeing the same issues come out in the CPAs where you have land being transferred to CPAs, but the individual land rights that are held by individuals, families, smaller communities, and people that aren't um, necessarily very powerful inside communities, those rights aren't really recognized. So what we need isn't to be replicating the Ngonyama Trust, what we need is a proper and comprehensive legal framework that exists to protect, recognize the rights of people and the land that like the rights of people in their land in the way that it actually exists. Um, so the, the, just seeing how um, the, the issue with the trust and its operations now, how hard it is to hold um, the trust accountable for its um, operations, how hard it is for individual community members to have their rights recognized and protected. Um, this isn't something we want replicated. What we need is for people to be seen as individuals and stakeholders in their land and communities to be seen as rights holders in their land and for us to protect those rights um, and not try to sort of give them over to some entity. I mean, so Mong is saying in the beginning, you were speaking about how um, colonial governments came and imposed this, this sort of state above what was existing in terms of traditional leadership institutions. Another aspect of, of colonialism was this idea that black people do not own their land, that people that black people do not hold the rights to the land and they're not capable of doing it themselves. We need to dispel ourselves of that. We need to recognize that individuals, communities, families have been, have been holding rights to land for generations. And we need to find a way to protect that and to recognize that and to give people agency and to give people um, their ability to control their lives instead of trying to create these institutions that hold rights to land on their behalf. That's what colonialism and apartheid was doing. That's what the apartheid government did. Apartheid government didn't give black people their rights to land. It held them for them and said, you guys can't hold that. And we need to move away from that. This trust isn't an answer in any sort of way, because again, excuse me, it prevents black people from having rights to land to hold and to control and to make decisions for themselves. Um, so this is definitely something that we should not be considering as something that can be replicated across the country. Um, so on the, I'm, I'm going to let Janet um, take the Eteguini question, but from my understanding, no, the, the Eteguini municipality has no control over how um, the trust operates on land that's vested in it. Um, I think there's been previously some um, conflict and contestation of land, whether or not land is actually vested in the trust or it's not vested in the trust. So as Janet was mentioning, um, that in terms of the Amendment Act, 
um, urban land is invested in the trust. It's mostly rural land in pockets across the province. But um, there is sort of overlap where there's questions about whether or not, for example, um, land vests in a municipality or in the trust. Um, but then outside of that, municipalities and their technical municipality have no say over how the trust acts on land that's been vested in it. I'll let you come in now, Janet. Um, just on the on the farms. So again, the problem really is is the fact th the farms that are vested in the trust and whether or not the trust should be leasing them. Um, I mean, I, I hope from my presentation I made it a bit more clear that we don't want the trust unilaterally leasing land out, even if it's vested in them, because that has huge implications for people's rights to land. KZN is so South Africa doesn't have pieces of land where no one has any rights to it. Um, so these farms that are might be vested in the trust in terms of like the title deed still have people that do have rights over that land. What we need is a proper process of, uh, of ensuring that people can actually use the land that they have um, and that people are able to access that land so that land doesn't lay bare, doesn't lay bare with no one using it in any way. Um, so I'm going to let Janet come in on the other questions. Um. Yes, just on, on the Queenie um, issue, yes, the, um, the, uh, the Trust Act did exclude um, urban areas, um, but, but just because of, of the way and wall-to-wall and -wall, uh, municipalities have existed, um, there are aspects of, of Ingham-Nyama Trust land that do seem to fall into, into some municipalities, and that has raised other issues, for example, whether or not rates rates are payable. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how, how this works in and around Ethiquini itself, but generally the Act did exclude um, uh, uh, urban areas. Uh, so, and there were the old um, uh, 294 townships, I think, um, but generally those have, have been um, or on the process of being transferred. Um, just coming to the question of um, just want to have a look here um, about the farms. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Sananda. I think that that's probably something that we want to move against and move away from and have a more overarching, more overarching policy than, than sticking to the, to the sort of trust model that has filtered through over centuries from um, sort of British colonial sort of practices. Um, and um, and so that I agree with her on that. Um, I think the question about uh, one of the panelists asking about members of the board, um, yes, that is correct that the members of the board have been, I mean, if you look from one financial year to the next, it's the same members on the board. Um, as I understand it though, that just recently this has changed and that the minister has appointed an interim board. Um, uh, I'm not sure that how that is flowing, flowing through at the moment. Um, whether or not somebody could be appointed to the board. Um, generally, the eight out of nine members of the board are, are appointed by, by the minister. This is in consultation with, um, uh, with the Nyama, I think also with the, um, uh, with the uh, KZN legislature. Um, I think generally over the years, it's been a rollover, but I think um, at the moment now, there's been heightened um, interest in in the um, in the board, and that um, uh, you know, and in fact, that's a good example of of how how the Inganyama Trust is irre irrevocably linked to the state. In that the minister has you know has the power to appoint the members of the board. Um, I, I hope that that um, um, that answers the question. Thank you both. Um, Lerato is Lerato still with us? I'm not seeing her. Here anymore. I, I don't see either. We seem to have lo lost Lerato. Um, I was going to ask if she had anything she wanted to, to respond to. But let, let's then take the next round of questions. There's been, uh, I mean, there are a lot of comments. Um, let me feed some of them in and then some questions. The one comment is government is failing communities on rural land um, throughout South Africa land that the government owns throughout South Africa. Why this focus on the Gonyama Trust is the question. Um, there's a question from Fatima, or that question is from uh, Baron Beatrice Ace. 
Uh, Fatima Osman um, makes this point. I wonder if you have a better way to regulate customary land, land rights. It seems part of the reason the trust operates is because of the gap in the law. Like you said, uh, land is held under old land regimes. None of the newer state interventions have been successful. Could you propose a better way uh, for land rights to be held? Uh, Emily Kiane says, um, how is this trust going to solve the issue of securing tenure for individual land rights holders, some of whom have papers? Um, she also says, uh, is there any provision made for upgrading the tenure rights for beneficiaries who live within the jurisdiction, uh, some of whom have PTOs, etc.? And her third uh, point is, what is the composition of the trust? Is there, uh, are there beneficiaries, are, are there, is there beneficiary representation, more especially uh, women? Uh, let's uh, look at one more. Uh, Gaino Parazza, my colleague from Paris, says, thank you for this illuminating webinar. Are there any safeguards for the community, for community land rights? Uh, to what extent does Tolobeni, the, the Tolobeni president, uh, provide an opportunity for communities to defend uh, their land rights? Let's take those um, and then we'll take, we'll probably have time for a round or uh, two more rounds of questions um, and comments. Okay. Um, just on the question around the general failure of the department of, of government and why we're focusing on the trust. So, I mean, we're not focusing on the trust. Um, this particular webinar is, is about sort of the trust, um, but the, the work that's being done by rural activists across the country are continuing to hold the, the various government departments, the Department of Rural Development, the Department of Mineral Resources, all these departments that have in some way a role to play in administering communal land or customary or land held by customary communities. There is ongoing work around um, sort of dealing with and trying to hold the state accountable for their failures, for their failures to um, to hold to hold institutions accountable, to hold traditional leaderships accountable, to ensure that private institutions and development companies are respecting people's rights to land, um, and to ensure that um, to ensure that um, people are are actually protected and their land isn't taken away from them. Um, I think the the unique situation. I mean, but we can't regardless of sort of the systemic failure of, the, of, of government and failing to really respond and protect people against land dispossession, I think we can't deny sort of the unique position of KZN with the trust. This trust is the only one that exists um, in the entirety of South Africa. Um, it holds millions of um, hectares of land. It generates millions of, la of, 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 of rands and in income from how it's using this land. So it's important to highlight this institution as well um, in, in the ongoing general attempts to hold government itself accountable um, for how it's been responding to the impacts of insecurity of tenure in people um, in, in rural communities. Um, yeah, so I think I've answered that question. Um, so in terms of a better way to hold customary land, uh, Sorry, and just also another thing, I think it's also important to be having um, continuous conversations about the trust, just to highlight the sort of shortcomings on, um, so I mean, there are different ways in which land can be held. Um, and I think sort of really getting into the issues and the problems with specific institutions um, and specific ways that a land is being held is really important because the state is going, is, go is, is sort of moving through an ongoing process of adopting legislation and creating a framework that's supposed to um, comply with Section 25.6. So seeing how CPAs work, seeing how the trust works in KZN, and seeing how other institutions are working is an important conversation that we need to be having um, in sort of framing how in future we'll be dealing with tenure and security um, in the former homelands. Sort of a better way um, in which to hold land. This is I mean, I guess this is the million dollar question of, so we have all these things that are clearly not working. Um, so what is it that we do to make sure that it works? I think the point of departure, which we're seeing that is lacking in the creation of trusts and in sort of the various iterations of laws that the, the Department of Rural Development 
um, seems to be sort of taking in framing legislation and, and in framing the legislative framework is, is sort of this, under, this, this idea that people in rural areas have no way or have no systems in place, that we need to be putting systems in place for them, for how they deal with their land and how they hold their rights to their land, how they protect themselves against um, institutions that try to sort of take their land away. So I think the point of departure is really speaking to communities and, um, and speaking to people about how is it you believe would best protect you against having your rights taken away from, from you instead of sort of sitting um, where government sits in offices and says, okay, let's do CPAs, let's do trusts, let's, um, tr let's transfer this land to traditional authorities and traditional authorities will deal with that. Um, conversations aren't being held with people who are actually live in terms of customary law, who actually hold lands to rights in terms of customary law. I mean, when whenever we're at public meetings or public hearings looking at legislation um, that in some way impacts customary land rights, people over and over say, I don't understand why we're being brought to this piece of legislation that we've never heard anything about um, that goes completely at odds with how our systems actually operate. Um, so there is, so I mean, I don't live in terms of customary law. I don't hold my land rights in terms of customary law. So I think the question should be sort of posed to people who actually do so because they're best placed to understand how their rights work and how to best protect them. And then in sort of a dialogue, we're able to then start thinking about, okay, well, this is how people who live in terms of the system say we should be dealing with their land rights. How then does that fare with the threats that exist? Um, and sort of how then do we sort of place this in a context that um, where title deeds exist, where the deeds registry office exists, where development companies want to come in and mine and build lodges and do all of these things in the context of that. So there's a balancing act that needs to be done, but the conversation shouldn't be had with just government officials, with just NGOs, with just um, experts. It should be had with people who are actually living in terms of these um, systems because they're best placed to understand how best to make sure that they're not um, getting the short end of the stick, which is basically what's been going on for the past hundreds of years. Um, so in terms of the, the, the safeguards, so I mean, the problem with the safeguards that, in, that, that exist for communities is that they're not implemented. So we have section 25, six of the constitution. We have the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act that recognizes that people hold rights in terms of customary law, that people hold rights in terms of different group tenure systems and those rights are valid property rights that are the same as people who hold title deeds. However, that's just not being implemented. Um, I mean, I think the Kolobeni example is a great example because I was the first, um, the Kolobeni community had to go to court for, their, for the court to say that these are people that hold property rights, these are people that hold land rights that need to be respected. And before you make a decision about what to do with that land, you need to speak to them and get their consent. That was that the massive thing that happened in Kolobeni just a couple of years ago. So this is with the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act existing since 1990, 1996. So, I mean, there isn't, so we have a good constitution, we have a decent APILRA. Um, I mean, APILRA has massive shortcomings and we need a permanent and more sort of, um, a more thought out and fleshed out framework to deal with these land rights. But the protections and safeguards that exist right now are just not being implemented and communities are left on their own um, to try and protect themselves against um, mining companies against developments who don't see their rights to land as valid property rights that need to be respected. So I'll just stop there and let Janet come in. Um, sorry, um, I, I think yeah, I, I think I'd like to deal with the question of uh, one of the questions about whether or not the beneficiaries have in of, of the Inganyama Trust have any say um, in respect of the trust or in, on on the Inganyama Trust board. I think this is a really important question. Um, just structurally, before I go into that, uh, just to say that the Inganyama Trust has one trustee, um, and in, and in um, 1997, a board was created to assist in the administration of the trust, which is obviously a, you know, a huge uh, land-owning um, land trust. Um, and the short answer to the question, no, the beneficiaries don't have any say in what happens on the board or with the trust and that's one of the issues why when we raise the question of accountability um, it is really concerning that there's these attempts made even to circumvent um, you know what protections are already in place in terms of the public finance management act 
which allows, which, which um, um, prescribes that public institutions must provide the proper, in, um, must be transparent and provide proper information to enable stakeholders to, you know, to have a meaningful input and to see what, what is, you know, being done with public funds. Um, and, and on that point, uh, you know, I think that's something that, that could, could be explored. I think there should be an examination, um, a, a, an important public examination on what information should be available and necessary uh, for all stakeholders to adequately satisfy, you know, their desire to, to see what's happening with the money and perhaps even have some form of representation, you know, on this board. Um, so, so I think that that is a really important point and, um, and perhaps, you know, that is the problem that there's a complete disconnect, it seems, between the, the, the board and, and beneficiaries or, or, you know, people that are, that are subject to, um, the, uh, you know, uh, decisions that are made by the board on their behalf. And um, it, it goes even further uh, where beneficiaries, you know, have told us anecdotally of, of trying to, um, trying to find and get, have get information, having to travel for long, long distances um, to Peter Maritzburg to have discussions with the board only to find that they can't see the right person and to have to come back. Um, there, there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be a, you know, a proper public um, forum for people to raise their concerns. Um, if, you know, people who, the board, even in their annual financial statements, say that if communities want to access funds, for instance, they have to request a business, uh, you know, have to provide business plans and, and it very much a, um, you know, a bottom up approach rather than a proper, uh, a, you know, thought out, uh, you know, programs for communities on the ground. And I think that beneficiary uh, representation on, on the board or, you know, or, or some sort of forum I think that that would that would be really important, and an examination about this has, really has to take place. Uh, thank you. I've got some great comments here. I'm going to just read uh, into the discussion, which I think responds to some of the things that have just been said and some of the questions we, we've asked. Uh, Mary De Haas, who's a, a long-time researcher um, and activist uh, in Wazul Natal, has this to say. She says, this is mainly a comment. Parts of the Itewini Metro are part of the trust, uh, e.g. peri urban rural areas. Uh, and there's a struggle going on about people living on land without paying rates. Uh, so perhaps Janet would like to comment. In many areas I work in, there's no transparency about what the trust is doing. It has given a lease to someone in Mpembe near Richards Bay, and people have been told they must move for oil, yet no details at all are given uh, to them. So there's clear collusion between the local traditional leadership and money given by the trust to the traditional council never filters through to the community. Um, uh, Mary also says, surely this trust is unconstitutional uh, as it discriminates against people in this province and those in others where traditional leaders don't have their own trusts. Um, there's a comment also, uh, this is also from uh, Mary, who says, please tell everyone that the chair of the board, uh, Jerome Gwenya, is a director of Zululand Anthracite Colliery, which has leases from the trust, and the conflict of interest is ignored. This mine caused untold hardship to the community, and even children are protesting and saying the mine is killing the nation. There's another uh, comment, uh, which I'm just trying to find here from uh, Desiree Erasmus. It says, Jerome Gwenya, who's the chairperson of the board is often said to be one of the stumbling blocks to getting the trust to function uh, according to the PEFMA. Uh, do the panelists agree with this? And why is Mr. Gwenya repeated, repeatedly made chair of the board? Does the minister not have a say in this along with the KZN Premier? How then would the government intervention make the trust better? Um, the, 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 there's also a set of questions which I'm not going to read out, but um, there's a, a question about um, what is the relationship between the trust um, and other traditional leaders uh, in the province? Is there a relationship? Uh, um, um, uh, what does that, how does that function? Um, and also, I mean, just let me read two more. Um, there was an early question, which this is a comment from uh, Spesi Hesifali. The policy and regulatory gap also requires law reform. 
a Community Finance Management and Development Act uh, could go a long way to give community members the tools to hold to account A, their community structures, whether a CPA or a trust, a customary law institution, a, a traditional uh, 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 council under the TLF, TLFGA, B, the state at all spheres, but in particular local government uh, with responsibilities, to, responsibilities towards customary communities on communal land. Uh, and third parties such as mining companies, shopping malls, agribusiness, etc. The PFMA and the um, MFMA provide examples of reporting, procurement mandates, and so on, but more is needed. There's also a comment from Spesile uh, Dagade, who says, good day, what steps have been taken to convert permissions to occupy to title deeds? Will this conversion automatically result in the rating of the properties causing residents uh, to be re responsible for municipal rates and taxes? Let's take those. Um, we are moving towards a close. So I'm going to ask you to respond relatively briefly so that we can get in another uh, last short round of questions. Um, Janet, just, do you, okay, you do want to go first? Um, yeah, I can just quickly go first. Zinanda, okay, go for it. So in terms of the the relationship between the trust and traditional leaders. So, I mean, I like I would say that it depends and um, it varies from community to community. Some traditional leaders have no relationship with the trust and some traditional leaders have a problematically close relationship with the trust. Um, and I think, so I mean from, so in terms of the communities that we've worked with, some traditional leaders are really um, against the charging of leases because they never see any any sort of money that comes from the leases or any sort of benefit that comes from the leases that are being charged from community members in their, in their community. But I think what can also be, what's also could be an indication of the type of relationship between the trust and the traditional leaders is that the basis of the audit that the minister um, has sort of instituted is as a result of many traditional leaders complaining about um, bribes being paid about them not benefiting from developments that are going on on lands that are within their jurisdiction and, and sort of going to the minister and saying that they're having a problem with how the trust is operating on land that falls under their jurisdiction. Um, so that, I mean, so one, that, is an, that can be an indication of how, um, of how people are, um, I mean, how traditional leaders and the trust are also interacting. But I think um, one thing that's particularly that I find concerning in relation to the fact that it's in response to complaints by traditional leaders that this audit is now coming, um, is that communities have been complaining about the operation of the trust almost since its inception. Um, and, and really only, like it's only when traditional leaders are saying, well, I mean, I'm not getting a big enough slice of the pie or other people are getting bribed and maybe I should be also getting something from all this that's going on on the land. Are we now are, are we now seeing the minister sort of saying, okay, we're now going to do an audit and we're not going to see look into deeply into the financial operations of the trust? I mean, the trust has been having adverse um, auditor general um, sort of conclusions for years now, um, and communities have been talking about how they are losing land that that um, they're being moved from land for the purposes of these developments and and sort of nothing happening. So I think the order thing is a good sort of, um, is a really great development um, and sort of the support of the uh, portfolio committee is a great development. But then now it's, I, I just find it really concerning who are we actually listening to and who's res and whose grievances and issues are we responding to if it needs to be traditional leaders as opposed to communities um, who have to be raising issues before um, substantive steps are taken to hold this trust accountable. Um, so Mary's comment is unfortunately a very sort of, this is exactly what happens in too many contexts where people are told of vague instructions that you guys are going to have to move soon. Um, we're going to be building a mine or we're going to be building a lodge or we're going to be mining in some sort of way um, and, and we're going to be doing it on your land um, and you need to move with no consultation, with no indication of where people are expected to move to, with no indication of what compensation um, they're going to be getting to replace the livelihoods and the land that they're using and with no um, engagement and working together to figure out like whether or not this is even a good thing for the communities or Kezaden in, in general. Um, so with the PTO and title deeds, so um, 
that's, I mean, that's, there are many issues with the upgrading of land tenure um, rights act. Um, the one that sort of sets out the processes of upgrading tenure, um, upgrading PTOs and, um, and deeds of grant to title deeds. Um, one of them being the fact that um, the, the, the biggest sort of issues in relation to that is really the, the fact that having a title deed completely erases the existence of other rights on that land. A title deed can only be in the name of one person um, and, and doesn't take into account the nuance that exists and how traditional communities um, hold their rights to land. And then there are the real questions of like, okay, so if you have a title deed, what does that mean in terms of things that you're incurring? Um, what costs are incurred as a result of that? So um, the, 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 the reality is ULTRA, which is the Upgrading of Land Tenure Rights Act, was never really a response to the systemic security of tenure issues. That was an apartheid era piece of legislation that was a band-aid that the apartheid government was putting in to make it seem like they were doing anything in respect of the really bad tenure um, situation that they created with years and years of racist laws that refused to recognize the validity of black people's rights to land. So that entire process is not a thought out process and it doesn't respond to the issues that exist. Um, so the operation of, of ULTRA and the upgrading of of PTOs and all these other rights to title deeds will just be creating more problems um, because it doesn't respond to the issues at hand. Um, I think that's I think that's it. I think the rest were comments. Janet, do you want to have anything to add? Uh, just to add on on Mary's comment, um, uh, that's uh, her comment about uh, monies filtering through to to the beneficiaries on Inganyama Trust land is precisely why we you know we had a look at because this is what obviously um, we could see you know it can be seen on the ground, which is why we then looked to see how it was being reported in annual financial statements and then seeing that it was completely vague, and and sort of. Um, you know, it's not only vague, it just, it just seems to be of little relevance in, in the annual financial statements. It's really disappointing. Um, and, and that is why, uh, you know, this, this question of, of um, saying that the PFMA doesn't apply to the trust must really be addressed um, and, and, and quite urgently, I think. Um, and then just a quick answer to the one question about um, whether or not you have an, a title deed and would it be automatically, I'm sorry, a PTO and would it be automatically upgraded to a title deed? Um, it would only automatically be upgraded to a title deed and this has sort of happened um, as Zananda mentioned because of the upgrading of Land, Land Tenure Rights Act, which as she said is was really a type of band-aid and, and it did have some unforeseen consequences. One of those was an automatic upgrade and that normally happened, um, that act is very much based on a survey, on, on the basis of having a survey available, which is expensive and which, um, you know, is, it can be complicated, but in certain areas that the, those were in place because of township surveys and that resulted in automatic upgrading to title deeds and then resulted in obviously rates having to be paid. Um, in, in areas where there's no survey, um, you know, that the autom an automatic upgrade can't happen. You have to have a survey in place before it, it you know, a PTI could, could be upgraded. But I, I, I agree with Sinande that, um, you know, that, that raises all sorts of other issues, um, you know, in relation to uh, the rights and who, who are, you know, who, who holds what. Um, there, there's agenda issues in, in that as well. All right, thanks. Let, let me, we've got uh, six minutes uh, remaining. I'm gonna cram in three more uh, questions, uh, but I'm not gonna read them word for word. I'm just gonna um, sort of give you the general drift of them. One is about, from Mahotla Sifuli, is asking what happens if the expropriation bill goes through? Um, does that mean that land could be expropriated that is vested in the Ngoyama Trust? The second one is uh, from, um, Danjel Midgley, uh, pardon me if I, uh, I mangle your names. Um, and it's about, uh, is there any litigation, has there been any litigation around the um, IPILRA, the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act and the uh, Nguyenyama Trust uh, itself? Uh, there, there is another question, um, which I can't find now, which asks what happened to the litigation that had started uh, before the lockdown? And then the last one is, the million dollar question, 
why is government uh, protecting traditional leaders who are bullying people? This is uh, from uh, Baby Mahedidisa. So let's take those as uh, our parting shots and any closing comments that you may have. Okay. Is it Andy? Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the sort of coming into effect of the expropriation bill will not have an automatic effect on the land held um, in the Mnyama Trust. Um, because I mean that land was trust was transferred and vested in there. So then that's a question around the Department of Rural Development and the state on like if this if that's something that they'd want to do. Um, but the sort of sort of expro I mean expropriating the land from the from the um, from the from the Ngonyama Trust wouldn't really respond to the security of tenure issues that we've been talking about. So, and the expropriation bill itself isn't a response to the security of tenure issues that we've been spoken, we've been speaking about. It isn't a silver bullet for land reform um, and and sort of achieving and filling in the sort of and sort of responding to the problems that have plagued land land reform since sort of its inception. So, um, I think. The, the thing that we need to be focusing on is sort of ensuring that, that the state actually passes legislation that complies with section 25, um, six of the constitution and recognizes and protects um, the security of tenure and tenure rights of people. Um, all these other issues really don't respond to that very core issue that people's rights to land are not recognized and are not adequately protected. Um, and that where the, the if the land vests in the trust, if the land is in the state's hand, those issues will still remain. Um, and those are the things that we need to be sort of putting in place to ensure that we respond to them. Um, so, and then the second question around litigation on Epilra and the ITV. So um, there's currently, and this also ties in with that question around the litigation that was um, started a couple of years ago. So. There, there's currently litigation that's um, against the trust related to their conversion of PTO rights and customary rights into leases, um, into the leases that I mentioned before. Um, so that is, so I mean, the, the question of converting ownership rights into leases without properly informing people and getting their consent of drastically changing their rights to land definitely implicates and at the center of it are people's appeal rights. So there is current litigation in that, in that sense that asks the, um, the question of how the Ngonyama Trust needs to be respecting rights that exist in terms of APILRA and how their policies of converting PTOs, of converting customary land rights into leases is a violation of APILRA and Section 25.6 of the Constitution. Um, and why is government protecting um, traditional leaders that are bullying? I mean, this is definitely a personal um, Opinion, but I think that it's it's this misconception that traditional leaders are are the way to access traditional communities, and that if you then in any way don't give traditional leaders what they want, or you hold them to account, um, or actually respond to what communities want to be um, dealt with in relation to the issues they have with traditional leaders, all of a sudden you are not going to be having access to that resource. Um, um, that is traditional communities, either for votes or either for um, for sort of also easing um, access to traditional land um, for the purposes of mining and for the purposes of building lodges, of building office buildings and building like sort of residential things. So it's a twofold thing. Um, traditional leaders are seen as a way to get access to people's votes and they're seen as a way to ease access to um, people's land because if all you have to speak to are traditional leaders and then they sign these leases or they sign these um, agreements on behalf of communities, then there isn't sort of that actually having to do the work of speaking to individuals and seeing them as agents and as free agents, as holders of rights, and therefore being um, at the center of how their land needs to be dealt with. That's going to be too complicated. It's just easier to speak to one human being, pay them off um, and not really have to be accountable to people um, that hold rights to land. And and all the panelists, I'm told you, uh, the system is going to cut us off at five o'clock. Okay. So I, I should just quickly say thank you, all of you. Um, I see the writer still on the line. I didn't realize she was. So I'm sorry we haven't brought you into the conversation. I'm sorry we can't answer all the questions. Let me say thank you to everybody, uh, to the panelists, and especially to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. 
and the Hans Seidel Foundation. Uh, thank you to Luck uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. We are hoping that we will continue this conversation. There are a lot of complicated issues that we need to deal with. Uh, the Goyama Trust is only just one of them, but there's a whole lot more to deal with land in light of the, the, the fact that there is the expropriation bill, there is a reconsideration of section 25 of the constitution currently being undertaken in parliament. So with that, uh, we are unfortunately gonna have to end it here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, everybody.